Inspirational Creatives, episode 277. Welcome to Inspirational Creatives. I'm your host, Rob Lawrence. Join me every Friday as I chat with successful artists, producers, and creative entrepreneurs who share powerful stories and strategies. They can help you to create the life that you want. Listen each week as these inspirational creatives show you how to take your creativity to the next level. You'll learn how to create a sustainable business that inspires others and gives you the financial freedom and lifestyle that you want. Thanks for listening. Make sure you sign up at inspirationalcreatives.com to get free exclusive bonus material. And now on with the show. Rob here and a very warm welcome to a special episode of Inspirational Creatives. Today I have the privilege of sharing with you the story and wisdom of an artist who has a studio not quite on my doorstep, but more like less than 10 metres away from my offices and studio here in the heart of Norwich, England. This is the second interview as part of a short series I've chosen to create as part of the Inspirational Creatives podcast to celebrate some of the incredible inspirational creatives that are right here in my own small city. During the five-year journey that I've been putting this podcast together for you, reaching out and connecting with experts in their own game all over the world, and as I've got to know some of the very inspirational people in my own city and county, I've grown to appreciate how amazing people surround us everywhere. I've chosen to call this short sub-series Bringing It Home as I decide the future of this podcast as it closes in on its fifth birthday and 300 episodes. The guest I'm delighted to share with you today is somebody who I met through placement. And what I mean by that is by being based in the same building and sharing the same landlord over the past couple of years. Today, he's an artist, a painter with a deep passion for Shakespeare, as you'll hear. And he is somebody who has a professional background in TV as a producer and as a director of theatre since the 1960s. He's been a senior tutor and a director at Lambda and is deeply respected by his friends, colleagues and audience, which include Judy Dench and Benedict Cumberbatch. At one point towards the end of last year and the beginning of this year, I became quite concerned as, although I'm not in my own studio that often, I realised I hadn't seen John for ages, only to find out that he's been experiencing some serious illness and had a few pivotal hospital visits recently. So I was quite excited to find him looking well just a few months ago, where I jumped on the opportunity to hear more of his own story and wisdom and record it to share it with you. So it gives me great pleasure to share with you today the first of a two-part interview with John Link. So, John, thank you for carving out a small piece of time of your day today to talk about you and your work. It's a pleasure, my dear. Um, I'd like to begin, yep. for our listeners' benefit, by asking you, I mean, it's a rather broad question, but mm. who you are and how you see yourself in the world today. Oh, my Lord. Well, I'm happy to be here. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, my name is John Link, and I am now... Pretty well a full-time painter. Yes. Historically, I worked in theatre and television as a director and producer. So that's my kind of DNA, if you like. I still work occasionally with actors as a kind of consultant. If the actors have a problem, you know, with a script or leading man or lady or whatever, I get called in by the agent to help out. And I recently did a job for Fox TV, working with a lead actor on a drama series who was having difficulties, and I was called in to help sort him out, really. So that's kind of what I do. Um, But that's a lesser part of my life now. I also, from time to time, work in one of the leading drama schools in London, uh, working with young actors on, basically on Shakespeare, really. But also I... I help them prepare for the business of acting, which is kind of different from the the fun part of acting, you know, mm-hmm. getting the job, mm-hmm. how to sell yourself, marketing themselves and so on, how they present themselves, how they impact in, in interviews and meetings. So I prepare them for that and help them with that and give them a few tricks to to kind of enable them to deal with nerves and anxieties and so on. So that's what I do. But most of the time I'm sitting in my studio painting. Mm. And my painting is, I'm self-taught and I've been painting, I suppose, pretty well um, on and off, but now full time for the last five, six years. Um, And my work, um, 
or the paintings I do, are in fact inspired by the writings of Shakespeare, by the plays, by the characters. Not historical records of productions or portraits of actors, but simply um, inspired, my imagination is inspired by his characters and plays. Um, and I've been one way or another connected with the plays for like 50 years, so they're kind of part yeah. of my DNA as well. Mm. So that's where I'm at, that's what I do. In your life, how do you find those two worlds meet? What, the Shakespeare world and the, the world we live in? Well, the you Shakespeare know? world and your painting, I was thinking more specifically. Uh, yeah, it's difficult to know. I, I, I kind of, my painting is spontaneous and to a certain extent intuitive. Um, I, I don't, I do sometimes, but usually I don't set out to paint a Hamlet or an Ophelia or a whatever. I tend to kind of doodle ideas and I see a nose or an eye or an ear or a shape mm. and it becomes a person who then becomes a character. Um, and that can change in the process. Um, you know, I can start off thinking, oh, this looks like a Macbeth, and it'll end up being a Juliet. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> That's just the way it kind of works. Um, at the moment, I'm working on a commission, which is a slightly different process. And that's what that painting on there is um, of a character that I did a painting of, which sold and somebody else saw the painting uh, and wanted <laughs> wanted another version of it. Yeah. I said I'd give it a go. I don't normally do commissions in that way, but yeah. because it's a bit inhibiting and a bit... You never quite know how it's going to turn out, and I certainly don't want to copy stuff. Yeah. But in this case, it's sort of worked out quite well. Um it, it, it's strange, really. I, it, it's just kind of... I have a relationship with the plays because I'm working on the plays a lot with young actors. And I think about the plays a lot. Um, uh, but I'm not trying to, as I said earlier, I'm not trying to record something yeah. particularly. Um, I mean, some of my stuff is has become more more abstract. I mean, the painting over there, for example, on, on the floor mm. there, where it's kind of just two figures. Um, and, and for me, that's a Hamlet and, and the ghost of Hamlet. Um, but it could just be two guys, <laughs> you know, just two, two people sitting in space. Mm. So it's kind of weird, really. Mm. I, it, it's difficult to define and... and there's no real particular formula. I just kind of go where the mood takes me, really. Mm. Um, I'd love to ask you about your earlier life, but before I do, how did you get into painting more recently? That's a long story, but I'll try and shorten it for you. Um, I was working at a major drama school for about 14 years ago, 2004. Is that 14 years ago? Yeah, something like that. Um, and... A number of us teachers were thinking of trying to create a project, that would raise some money for some of the kids who had were having a hard time financially. And the idea was that I would, because I've always drawn and scribbled and fiddled and doodled, mm. that I would try and sell some of my little drawings at a at an event. I'd auction them off and maybe raise, you know, a few hundred quid that way. Um, that event never happened, but I'd kind of gotten on committed to the idea of pursuing it myself, so I did, and got nowhere, really, <laughs> one way or another. I was busy and, and so on. But having dinner with a friend, an actress friend, one evening, and she asked me how my project was going, and I said, oh, well, I've given up on it, really. I can't be bothered. It's, you know, it's too much effort and... Uh, um, I've moved on. And she said, oh, because I've got a cousin who's got a gallery in London, an art gallery in London. Would, you, would, you, would it be helpful to meet her? Because I'd been looking for spaces to do something. And I said, yeah, yeah OK, yeah, all right. And I, 
I said, who's your cousin? And, and she said, it's Victoria Miro. Well, I kind of took a while picking my jaw off the table because Victoria is probably one of the, if not the biggest contemporary um, gallerist in London and internationally. Turner Prize winners and, I mean, really big, big, big time. So I went up and met with Victoria, with Victoria, who was very charming, very patrician, but very charming. I spent a couple of hours with her, wandering around her gallery. And she was kind of intrigued by, I think, what I was trying to do. And she said, OK, you can have... This was September, a September time. She said, you can have the gallery in March for a week. You can follow Yoko Ono. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, OK. And I came out and I thought, what the hell am I going to do? Her gallery is huge. It's like a football pitch. And I got these little drawings. <laughs> so I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I need, I need a theme. I need something to hang my hat on. And I phoned my wife. And she said, well, you're always doing doodling Shakespeare. So, sh yeah, I mean... Kind of stating the obvious, really, but yeah, well, yes, absolutely. I then had a dear friend who was an established painter um, who's no longer with us, alas, but he, I used to sit in his studio sometimes and chat to him about painting, and his son and my son were close friends. Um, and that, that's him there on the wall, that little mm -hmm. drawing I've got on the wall. Um, and I said, Roy, it's called Roy Spencer, and he'd been head of life drawing at Chelsea Art School for 30 years. So he was a well-established mm. kind of guy. I said, what the hell am I going to do? He said, you go big, you go colour. And he told me what to buy and paints to buy and so on. So that's how it started. And we did, we did the event some five, six months later, during which time I'd painted like a mad thing all sorts of stuff, which I had no idea whether it would work or not. And um, the first evening we made 13 grand. <laughs> and people were saying, you've got to keep going, you know, keep, because we like the work. Uh, all sorts of odd different people. Uh, that's what started it. So out of sort of an idea of doing some silly little project mm. to maybe raise a few hundred quid became this thing. Yeah. And grew into a, a second career for yeah. me, really. Yeah. And that's what I, that... So that's how it started. Um, and, and it's been a good career. I mean, I don't make a fortune, but I'm... Yeah. I sell. Yeah. But I am lucky because I've got chums in the business. Yeah. Um, and, of course, I didn't really realise it at the time, but Shakespeare, although he's very special to us culturally here he's also global mm. so there are, my stuff is hanging on a wall somewhere <laughs> yeah. around the world yeah which is great um so that's how it started by accident mm. more than design but boy am i grateful because it, it, it it's given given me a wonderful sort of second career mm. Mm. really or third career because from being a professional in the business of theatre and television, I then became a teacher at Lambda, which is a leading London drama school. Uh, and out of that came this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of gone full circle, um, really, for me. I mean, what's strange, perhaps not strange, is, but when I, when I, I left school when I was 14 and a half, um, and when I went home from school one day in the middle of school time, um, I just left the school, walked out, went home. And my mother was at home. And she said, oh, what are you doing here? I said, I've, I've decided I don't like school, I don't want to go back. She said, oh, what are you going to do? I said, not having a clue, of course. I said, oh, I'm going to go rather grandly. I'm going to go around the world. And she said, what an interesting idea. Let's sit down and look at the world. So we got an atlas out. We sat on the floor. And she helped me plan this mythical journey around the world. 
which actually sort of started off with me going to Denmark uh, and, and she set that up for me because she had a friend in Denmark who she knew would keep an eye on me. Mm. Uh, so the whole thing was planned. That was to, to be my first stop on this grand tour. Yeah. Um, but what she did when I set off with my rucksack and my guitar, which I never learned to play, but you always carried a guitar in those days. <laughs> um, <laughs> she put in my rucksack the complete works of Shakespeare. Hmm. And she said, if ever you're lonely or you've got or you're bored, you've nothing to do, look at the sonnets and read the plays. They're great stories. And I thought, oh yeah, 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 all right, you know. There it was in my rucksack, weighed a ton, like a telephone directory. <laughs> but I took it with me. And indeed, I did read it mm. from time to time. And the stories and so on. So that's it's quite interesting, really, in a kind of a way, how my life has come back to him mm -hmm. in terms of painting. Mm -hmm. So he's been with me in that sense. Mm. Well, 50 years, 55 mm. years, mm. Uh, or more. In fact, more, 60. God almighty. Mm. 60 years. So, so going back to your early <laughs> life then, um, can you... From from where you see your life today, mm. how easy is it for you to join the dots in terms of some of those early influences and early moments of inspiration? Can you can you were there hints of who you've become over the last few decades? Uh, there there are two aspects to this. One is one has a sort of personal ambition or goal, I suppose, or dream. And then there's the reality of life right? and how that inter interfaces and changes things. And I kind of, when I came out of my world tour <laughs> thing, um, which remained, I remained in Scandinavia, really. Yeah. But after about five years of doing that, I decided I wanted to go into theatre. There's another story behind that, but I won't bore you with that now. Um, we'll sort come of to meeting that next. people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've always been very lucky in my life, in that for some reason I've always bumped into people who've sort of influenced me or helped me or guided me in some way, and that happened to me while while I was in Denmark, and it took me into the theatre world, and. I thought, I want to be an actor. <laughs> um, and I talked to Danish actors because I used to hang around stage doors and Danish theatres and things and make myself a nuisance of myself. I was all of 17 then, I suppose, mm. something like that. Um, and they all said to me, if you want to be an actor, go home. You've got the best acting. If, if we could, would work in England, we would go our, you know. So eventually... I found myself back in this country and I was then like 19, 18, 19. And so I had this clear plan. Yeah, I'm going to be an actor. And that meant training, meant going to drama school because there was no direct way into the world of acting then. Although I did try. Um, nobody wanted to know. So I went to drama school and pursued a training where, in fact, I met my wife. So that's a, mm. another story. Um, came out of drama school not wanting to be an actor, mm. but wanting to be a director. So already I'd shifted and changed. Mm -hmm. um, and I, why didn't I want to be an actor anymore? A, because I actually, if I was very honest with myself, I don't think I was very good at it. And I couldn't see myself being successful at it. Um, which may or may not have been a right <laughs> decision. I have no way of knowing. Um, but I decided I quite liked the idea of directing because I directed odd bits at drama school with my colleagues. I like telling people what to do. Um, I like the idea of not having to learn lines. And I had this sort of sense of enjoying working with people in the space, in that collaborative way. But it was very studenty. 
So when I came out of drama school, then there was a what was called a repertory system, and, and the normal channel was you went into rep and you acted or you worked in some capacity in a theatre and you worked your way up the, the ladder. And I was picked up and joined a repertory theatre in Derby, called Derby Rep, as it was then, as an, what was called an acting ASM, which was basically stage management, but if, you, if they needed somebody playing a small part, you played it, mm. regardless of whether it was an 80-year-old or a 10-year-old. Um, and I did that for a year. And during that year, I wanted to kind of test my directorial aspirations. And the director of the theatre said, why don't you do a Sunday night performance of a one-act play for our local playgoers society? And so that's what I did. And as, as a lowly ASM, I asked a couple of members of the company if they would mind performing in a little play I was going to do one Sunday night. And they were terribly kind to me hmm. and indulgent. And so I did this Sunday night thing, which was a huge success. A little one-act play. So I was asked to do another one. So I did another one. The girl who was the assistant director at the theatre at that time had fallen pregnant. I won't go into that because it was scandalous, but a poor girl fell pregnant and had to leave when it became obvious because of local issues. And I knew this was going to be happening. And I knew, therefore, the job would become vacant. So when it became <laughs> vacant, which it did duly, at the end of that year, I asked the theatre director if I could apply for it. He said, yeah, good, why not? And I got the job. So, again, I was lucky. You know, I was just mm. in the right place at the right time, and I met somebody, and, 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 and he <coughs> was very supportive, the theatre director at the time. And so I started directing plays a year after leaving drama school. So I, that's, so I became a director. So my ambition then was, was to become the best director. Um, and I, I, I remember saying, boasting, that I was going to be director at the National Theatre in 10 years' time. That was my, <laughs> my goal. Um, which, as you can see, never happened. Um, because I got involved in other things. I, I moved from theatre to theatre. I ended up at Oldham Rep. I did a production there. In a, it was then Weekly Rep. I did a production there of Twelfth Night. There's another story around all that as well. But hmm. I realised when we were going to do the play that we hadn't got somebody to play the main part. No, it was Richard II, sorry. Richard II. We hadn't got a Richard on the company. So being bold and young, I rang the RSC and said, have you got, I got through to somehow the director of the theatre, a man called David Jones, who was at the Old Witch, who ran the Royal Shakespeare Company's London Company, not the Stratford Company. And I got through to him and he didn't know who the hell I was and I didn't know who the hell he was. And we had this rather strange conversation. Anyway, he said, finally, what, what would he want? And I said, I'm looking for a young actor to play Richard. Have you got somebody on the company who might, might fancy the idea of testing himself? And he said, well, how long have you got? And I said, well, it was a week's rehearsal. I might get eight days. They, of course, were used to 12-week rehearsals. Mm. He said, well, you're crazy. How can you do it in a week? I said, well, that's the deal. Well, he said, leave it with me. He came back. Anyway, he provided me with, a, with, with an actor, a young actor called John Bell, who'd understudied an actor called David Warner, who'd played Richard very successfully at Stratford. And John came, and he was wonderful. Not only was he a brilliant actor, but he, he, he was just so kind. and He was my age, but he knew a lot about Shakespeare. Um, uh, and we cut the play and we changed it. And, uh, we did it. It was a great success. Largely down to him rather than me. Nevertheless, subsequently, I was summoned to Stratford for tea, mm. to have tea with Peter Hall and John Barton, who were then running Stratford. And they'd 
been intrigued by what I'd done and thought it was, considering it was eight days rehearsal, quite interesting. So I was summoned to tea. That was fine. They were terribly charming and nice. A bit older than me. I mean, Peter was very young then, but he was still ten years older than me, really. Mm. Uh, and John, much the same. Uh, and uh, we had a long afternoon at Stratford, chatting about Shakespeare and so on. And I got very frightened and insecure because we started, they started talking in depth about Shakespeare. Now, those were both, they were both Cambridge graduates and incredibly brainy and incredibly knowledgeable about Shakespeare, whereas I was an itinerant director who dipped in and out but knew the plays but kind of didn't. Mm. And they started to ask me questions, rather searching questions about the plays. <laughs> like, you know, if you were directing Hamlet, Act 4, Scene 3, when Gertrude meets Polonius, how would you... Mm. I hadn't got a clue. I said, I don't know, I haven't a clue. I think I'd read Hamlet once. Mm. <laughs> you know? um, so it was a bit strange. And I left Stratford feeling a bit deflated because I thought, actually, I know nothing. Mm. I really know nothing. About five weeks later, David rang me and said, we want to offer you the job. <laughs> They'd appointed Trevor Nunn the year before as an assistant. We'd like you to join up with Trevor and Peter and be an assistant director. Um, and I was completely dumbfounded because Trevor also is Cambridge Mafia, mm. you know. And I thought, I said to David, what am I going to do confronted with those three guys, confronted with a team of actors who are very experienced in the main? Mm. And what am I going to do with 12 weeks rehearsal? I'm used to one week's rehearsal. Yeah. What am I, how am I going to fill the time? How yeah. am I going to do it? He said, we need someone like you mm. coming at it from a different place. It'll be great for you. You'll learn. You won't be directing plays. You'll be doing bits and pieces. It'll give you a terrific experience. And I said, no, I can't do it. I can't do it. And I turned it down. Hmm. And he pursued me for some while. Meanwhile, I'd had interest from Granada Television, which was then Granada Television, um, and also interested from a guy called Lloyd Shirley, who was a producer, and he was going to be head of drama at Thames Television, which was a new major independent company. And he wanted me to join him. And so I was confronted with this choices. And London won out. And David Jones, the Shakespeare guy, had been pursuing me, and he kept saying, you're crazy, man. But I didn't do it. And I went into television. So that's how I made that move. So, John, that moment when you thought, I want to be an actor, <laughs> just going back to that, what was it about acting that inspired you? It was the excitement of being in the theatre and seeing other actors, the sort of storytelling side of things and the... I suppose what I thought was glamour as well. Mm. Um, it wasn't intellectual and it wasn't particularly perceptive. My, my view, I was just there thrilled at the whole thing of the excitement of the curtain up and the actors and the, the personalities and the kind of life they seemed to be leading, which seemed to me to be wonderful. Um, they didn't seem to do, do very much hard work. Um, there was lots of fun in the pub after the show. And I thought, this is a really nice life. I mean, actually, an actor's life is pretty tough and hard. Mm. But at that time, it was, it was really the sort of glamorous elements. I thought, oh, I could fancy this. Mm. I wasn't thinking then in terms of film or television or particularly celebrity. Mm. But it was the sort of life they seemed to be leading. I thought, I, I could... I could, I could enjoy this. <laughs> I, could, I could be part of this. Yeah. Um, 
And of course, the, the, the actors there at that time were in pretty constant work because they were state paid. Right. The state supported actors. They had pensions. They had, you know, I mean, the whole structure. So their lives were quite comfortable in that sense, financially. They weren't making fortunes, but they were living well. They had the same sort of status as doctors, mm. lawyers, and so on. Mm. Um, as indeed most actors throughout Europe at that time were in Germany and France and so on. It wasn't quite the same in England. In England, it, we were still sort of travelling vagabonds, really, mm. in terms of status. Apart from the few that had become very successful uh, and were, 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 were rich and famous. Um, but uh, to go back to your question, I think, I think, yeah, I was just seduced by the atmosphere. I mean, I was alone in a foreign country, swept up in, the, in this extraordinary sort of magic carpet of things that was going on. Um, and I just thought, I want, I want, this is going to be my life. Um, the reality, of course, is quite different, yeah. particularly when I came back to the UK. You know, I didn't realise that it wasn't just a question of you know, falling into a job and having fun. Yeah. And in fact, an actor's life is, is quite hard. <clears throat> I mean, in, in England, the hard part is dealing with unemployment, not being, not working as an actor, um, you know. The, the reality is that something like 94% of actors at any time are out of work. Mm. And it's a little 6% or 8% or whatever at the top who are in work all the time. Anyway. Yeah. So that's that's how it, yeah. So I, I'm not, not really one to compare, but... I'll ask the question anyway. In terms of your relationship with that profession yes. and the relationship that you have in the profession that you've chosen now with yeah. painting, what are the similarities in terms of the what it means to you? What it means to me is that the creative process kind of remains the same. You know, I'm confronted with a canvas. As a director, you're confronted with a space. The canvas needs peopling in some way or form, whether it's a tree or whether it's a person, it doesn't matter, or a motor car or a seagull. Um, the space needs to be peopled by actors. So that's a kind of sense in which those two elements are very similar. And the process for me is to do with asking questions, really, and, and, and attempting to answer questions and those questions are to do with when you're working with an actor are to do with where do we go with this what is the story what is the background what is the life behind this play and what is the, what are the characters lives are about so it's asking questions and attempting to answer those questions and therefore filling that particular space with the story which has other elements as well as the human elements it has color it has light it has sound usually, some shape or form. Now, in a sense, although it's more of a singular process in that when I'm looking at a canvas, I'm not interacting with a group of actors, I am coming from the same sort of story element. What story is behind this, you know? What's coming out of this moment when I make a mark on the canvas, what is that mark about? Where's it come from? Where's it going to? Where's it leading me? And so on. And then out of that, you start answering questions. Well, I think it's going to be this or that. And so you think, well, that's interesting. I'll pursue that. Mm. And, and that's the same as one's interaction with actors. You know, you're asking as a director, you're asking questions of the actor. Why are you doing that? What, 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 where are you coming from there? And the actor replies, and you say, well, okay, but what about this or what about that? And where do we go? And So it's the same sort of thing, really, except I'm talking to myself <laughs> when I'm painting. Um, and it is about those same questions, and then out of that comes, hopefully, something that is 
says something about Oh, it sounds a bit coy, really. But it says something about human nature. Mm-hmm. Who am I? What am I? Why am I? Which is what plays are about. And it's, in a sense, what the process of painting is about. Um, and, and the characters I paint, when they are characters, are always at a moment where they're asking that very question of themselves. What am I doing here? Why am I here? What's happened to me? Where do I go next? What choices do I have? You know, and so on. And those are those of those questions and answers surround what I do with painting. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But it is for me actually a very similar process. Because I wasn't taught how to paint or wasn't taught taught about painting. I have no technique other than what I pick up and have taught myself or I've snaffled from somebody else. So I don't start with a form or a shape or particularly. That comes out of me improvising. But fundamentally, it's, it's the same. It boils down to those of us that are spend our lives dealing with a creative process of one sort, whether we're dancers or musicians, poets, writers, novelists, painters, actors. It doesn't matter. There are two elements. One is making a living, and the other is at the same time saying, why am I doing this? What am, what's it about? Mm. And it also, it always, it always leads me back to Shakespeare. You know, to be or not to be is the fundamental question we're all confronted with. What am I going to do next? How do I deal with this problem? What's caused the problem? How am I affected by it? Um, will I survive? Will I be able to make my way beyond this point? Uh, is there God? Is there another life? Is there? I mean, those are the kind of they're in different levels, but those philosophically, those are the questions since ancient Greeks. Shakespeare is at the heart of that, and that's why, for me, Shakespeare is very contemporary, because these are questions we all ask ourselves all the time. What the fuck am I doing? You know, mm. where do I go next? Am I making the right decisions, and so on, in love and in business and in, well, almost every choice we make in life. Mm. So the things all all overlap, and because I'm involved in a creative world, I feel I'm very fortunate because I'm spending my whole time playing with those ideas and notions in one shape or another. Mm -hmm. There's no definite answer to anything, of course. We make a choice and we hope. And we run with it until we run out of steam (laughs) or the choice proves to be inappropriate or unhelpful. Then we have to make another choice. How do I get out of that and go into something else? Yeah. Story of my life, really. But perhaps the story of all our lives, you know, to a greater or lesser degree. I mean, some people fall into a pattern because their parents were doctors or teachers or whatever. And there's a kind of sense of, there's a hierarchical sense uh, in which sometimes people fall into a pattern of, of a life. And that's fine. I mean, that's perfectly valid. I'm not... But for me personally, that never happened. <laughs> Mine's been kind of haphazard, really. Snatching and clutching at straws a lot of the time. Sometimes making rather silly amounts of money and sometimes being on the poverty line, you know. Mm. Join me again in part two of my chat with John later this month, where John shares in greater detail how he is making a life around his painting work today and the rewards and challenges that come with living creatively. The joy for me has been through my particular journey is the fortunate or the good fortune to rub up against some very special people who've remained friends. And, and, you know, that's kind of been huge for me. And certainly now I'm trying to sell paintings. <laughs> you know, I have a clientele who've been very supportive. Make sure you don't miss part two with John by subscribing to Inspirational Creatives through your favourite podcast listening app. I'll chat to you soon. Thanks for listening. 
Nothing beats the stories and advice of an expert to help you raise your creative game. I would love to know what you thought about today's episode, so don't forget to subscribe in iTunes where you can rate and review the show. If you like this episode, I invite you to share it on Facebook or Twitter with the one person you know who will benefit from the wisdom shared here today. You can find the show notes on inspirationalcreatives.com forward slash podcast. If you have a burning question or a great idea for a guest, head on over to inspirationalcreatives.com forward slash contact where you can connect with me there.